Hey everyone, it's Maxi. Welcome to a, another video. Um, today is going to be a collab with my good friend Mad Blender. So I will link her video below and her channel. Check her out. She is awesome and she has recently gotten into a lot of leftist theory. Um, she made a real good video about Gramsci and hegemony that I think that my subscribers would enjoy. I'm going to focus the most of my video on structural adjustment programs and the sinister motivations behind them and the reasons why they were so disastrous in so many countries. I honestly feel like I could make an entire series about the World Bank and the IMF and structural adjustment programs because there is so much to cover and there are so many coups and catastrophes that are associated with these institutions and these policies. Um, but I'm going to try and keep it pretty straightforward today. So I will recommend Confessions and New Confessions of an Economic Hitman by John Perkins um, and The Shock Doctrine by Naomi Klein. Both of these do a really great job in detailing exactly how debt has been weaponized against the developing nations of this world and how the oppressive global hierarchy that we live in today is actively produced and maintained. So the IMF and the World Bank were both born after World War II. They were created in order to help the European nations with post-war reconstruction and after that their emphasis shifted more towards so-called third world development. Both institutions are headquartered in Washington and the head of the World Bank is always an American and the head of the IMF is always a European. This is why the economic ideology behind their prescriptions is often called or referred to as the Washington Consensus. Um, you also might hear neoliberalism or austerity. All of these things are representing a similar kind of economic philosophy that pushes the idea that development is best sought through the freeing of markets. The main tenets of the Washington Consensus are privatization of public services, uh, retrenchment of the public sector and reducing subsidies or public spending, um, financial liberalization, trade liberalization, and currency devaluation. SAPs, or Structural Adjustment Programs, which basically started to roll out in the 70s and 80s after the debt crisis, um, they were targeted at developing nations, usually nations that had oil or some kind of other resource that the US or wealthy Western countries wanted to exploit. So these nations were targeted and they were convinced to take on loans um, for development projects, often through threats of violence or outright coups, and then these loans would come with the conditionalities that I laid out before, so privatization, deregulation, liberalization, and currency devaluation. While this was sold as a way of massively boosting the economy, which was again assumed to be universally good for everyone in terms of development, um, it had less than desirable impacts nearly everywhere. John Perkins, author of The Confessions of an Economic Hitman and The New Confessions as well, who was the former chief economist for Maine, uh, an international consulting company working with the World Bank, explained that there were two primary objectives of my work. First, I was to justify huge international loans that would funnel money back to Maine and other US companies such as Betcher Halliburton, Stone and Webster, and Brown and Root through massive engineering and construction projects. Second, I would work to bankrupt the countries that received those loans after they had paid Maine and the other US contractors, of course, so that they would be forever beholden to their creditors and would present easy targets when we needed favors, such as military bases, UN votes, or access to oil and other natural resources. The fact that the debt burden placed on a country would deprive its poor citizens of healthcare, education, and other services for decades to come was not taken into consideration. He he discusses meeting leaders of big corporations such as Texaco who admitted that they basically own developing nations. They control the military, they pay their salaries and buy them equipment, and then the military will protect them from local people who don't want oil rigs on their lands. The corporations themselves don't actually pay for all of this. The American taxpayer does. The money throws through USAID, the World Bank, the CIA, and the Pentagon. One CEO is quoted as saying, remember, countries like this have long histories of coups. If you take a look, you'll see that most of them happen when the leaders of the country don't play our game. Let's just say that governments that don't cooperate are seen as Soviet puppets. They threaten American interests and democracy. The CAA doesn't like that. So I'll talk a bit more about real world examples of this stuff later on, but first I want to talk about why the theory behind structural adjustment itself was doomed to failure from the start. So privatization and the retrenchment of the public sector, which is assumed to be good for efficiency and you know boosting the economy, quote unquote, 
can have very disastrous effects for marginalized people or just the working class. Retrenchment of the public sector leads to great job losses for public sector employees, and employment in the private sector is far more precarious. Typically prices will go up, and so a price wall is raised for the most vulnerable who are denied access to basic services like healthcare, education, food, etc., which used to be publicly served. The removal of subsidies also lessens the quality of that healthcare and education, etc. The removal of agricultural subsidies means that farmers have a harder time competing with cheap imports, and so local farming or subsistence farming is often destroyed, and food is imported from places that do subsidize agriculture like the US and Canada. Once again, with the retrenchment of the public sector and loss of jobs, precarious employment, and having to pay extra fees for basic services, um, the food security in many of these nations were seriously affected. Basically, they were taking people who were food secure but cash poor and making them cash poor and food insecure. So overall, this led to fewer people being able to access basic services or resources. And uh, combined with liberalization, it opened up the markets to allow foreign multinationals to come in and exploit the cheapest labor possible, with which often targeted children. Trade liberalization, once again, this opened countries up to exploitation by foreign multinationals, which was like really the main point of these saps in the first place. And a gross global imbalance was very much encouraged. So again, they encouraged everyone to abandon subsistence farming, and they encouraged people to grow cash crops for sale on the global market. Of course, they encouraged all of these countries to produce similar crops, cocoa, sugar, coffee, etc. So this flooded the global market and the price of these commodities dropped. As well, exporting raw materials and importing finished products has never been a good route to development. Richard Robbins says, At first glance, it may seem that the growth and development of export goods such as coffee, cotton, sugar, and lumber would be beneficial to the exporting country since it brings in revenue. In fact, it represents a type of exploitation called unequal exchange. A country that exports raw or unprocessed materials may gain currency for their sale, but they lose it if they import processed goods. The reason is that processed goods, goods that require additional labor, are more costly. Thus, a country that exports lumber but does not have the capacity to process it must then re-import it in the form of finished lumber products at a cost that is greater than the price it received for the raw product. This is, of course, a continuation of the colonial models that did exactly this, where the colonies were set up as shop houses producing raw materials, and the parent countries would then process these into finished goods and sell them back to the colonies at an inflated price. This was all made worse by the conditionality of currency devaluation. They forced developing nations to lower the value of their currency with respect to the US dollar. This was done in theory to help developing nations. The idea was that if their exports were cheaper on the global market, then developed countries would buy more of their products, which would increase their overall sales. It was also thought that if US imports became more expensive because of the tinkering of the currencies, then it would encourage those countries to not import but to produce those products at home. Of course, they were following the same strategy in so many developing nations, and they were flooding the market with these same commodities, so it really did nothing to actually improve their overall sales. What happened was that countries would buy the same amount of goods, but the developing countries would just get a lower amount of money for selling them. Similarly, this just made US corporations more money because they controlled the means of production, they controlled the industries that would produce the final products, and so developing countries still had to import what they needed, they just had to pay a higher price for it. So they were selling cheaper and buying dearer. A great, a great path to development, am I right? So. Do you think that the leading global economists could have predicted this? That their wild forecasted growth would never really come to fruition? Yes, the answer is yes. Once again, I'll point to the Confessions of an Economic Hitman, where John Perkins, who was not even trained as an economist, was hired as the chief economist for Maine, and his main goal was to produce studies that would show immeasurable growth potential in these countries to convince them to take on loans from the World Bank. Everyone in that industry knew that their forecasts were wildly over-exaggerated, but the point was to secure the business and to keep those countries in debt, and thus continually subservient to the US and the broader neoliberal economy. 
If leaders could not be reasoned with, then they were not above using violence or outright coups to secure what they needed. It's fairly common knowledge now how the CIA has been involved, directly involved, in overthrowing democratically led leaders who would not play the game of freeing up their markets for foreign exploitation. I'm sure everyone is aware of the example of Iran. In 1951, Iran rebelled against a British oil company that was exploiting Iran's natural resources and its people. The company was the forerunner of British Petroleum, which is today's BP. In response, the highly popular democratically elected Iranian Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh, um, <laughs> excuse my pronunciation, um, he nationalized all of the Iranian petroleum assets. England was outraged and sought help from the United States. However, both countries feared that taking military retaliation would provoke the Soviet Union into taking action on behalf of Iran. Instead of sending in Marines, Washington dispatched the CIA agent Kermit Roosevelt, who was Theodore's grandson. He won people over through payoffs and threats and enlisted them to organize a series of street riots and violent demonstrations, which created the impression that Mossadegh was both unpopular and inept. In the end, he went down and spent the rest of his life under house arrest. The pro-American Shah became the unchallenged dictator. John Perkins says, By the time I enrolled in Boston University's business school, a solution to the Roosevelt as CIA agent problem had already been worked out. U.S. intelligence agencies, including the NSA, would identify prospective EHMs, or economic hitmen, who could then be hired by international corporations. These EHMs would never be paid by the government. Instead, they would draw their salaries from the private sector. As a result, their dirty work, if exposed, would be chalked up to corporate greed rather than to government policy. In addition, the corporations that hired them, although paid by government agencies and their multinational banking counterparts with taxpayer money, would be insulated from congressional oversight and public scrutiny. This has been repeated in various other states, Indonesia, Iraq, Panama, Chile, Ecuador, Venezuela, this is ongoing right now. Every single time they use red scare tactics, any country that is taking a development path that is against or rejecting US neoliberalism, US imperialism, they paint as just, you know, the scariest, most awful place. They impose strict economic sanctions and then blame that country for having economic issues. They fund violence and riots in the streets. I mean, it's happening right before our eyes. And it's very ironic that, you know, what's painted as scary is moving towards democratic socialism. And what is not scary is what has and is continuing to go on day by day, hour by hour in this global economy, this global empire of this Washington consensus type thinking. So I want to give a special thanks to my patrons. I got a number of new pledges once again. So thank you so much for your support. I really appreciate it. Check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and also check out my new podcast at veganvanguardpodcast.com. Um, like, share, subscribe, comment, and I will see you in another video.